it's good to be with you again. We're continuing our study on angels, demons, and you. It's that end you part that makes all the difference. This is not a theoretical discussion. We're trying to understand how spiritual forces influence our lives. In this session, we're going to talk about spiritual terrorism. <laughs> it's an awkward truth, but it's an important one. You know, there are some truths we'd just rather not think about. We try to avoid them. Maybe you avoid doctor's appointments or dentist appointments, or you don't like to to read the letters that come from the IRS, but the reality is all of those things are really helpful pieces of information. Well, knowing the truth about the spiritual forces that are shaping your days and will determine the outcome of your future is not just important, it's essential. So grab your Bible, get a notepad, most of all, open your heart, and let's see what God has for us today. We're working through a series on angels, demons, and you. And the end you is the important part. It's not a theoretical discussion. We've spent some time talking about how to invite the Spirit of God into our lives, how to be aware of the angels that God has at His disposal as our helpers. But we need to equally be aware of the, the spiritual forces of darkness that are arrayed against us because they're just as certain. It's not theoretical. We need to understand how to engage in that conflict. So the title for this particular session is Spiritual Terrorism. I don't intend it as a threat. One of the ways of understanding history is in, in methods of warfare. World War I was about trench warfare. Vietnam was about guerrilla warfare in the jungles of Southeast Asia. For several years, we've been involved in conflicts in the desert, and those are wide open spaces. So distance matters and covering that distance. And well, terrorism is, is a, in the way it's being practiced today is changing how conflict happens. You know, in the Revolutionary War, when the, the farmers and the woodsmen in the colonies had to fight the British regulars. The British regulars lined up in bright red coats in straight lines on the battlefield. And the woodsmen from the colonies had been shooting squirrels in the forest. So they stood behind trees and shot the officers. It was an effective strategy, but it was against the rules. And one of the ways of understanding the changing course of history is when different types of warfare have been implemented. And terrorism, as we watch it today, is a change. Terrorism is about combatants on the field of conflict who don't wear uniforms, who don't identify with a nation. They're identified by an ideology. They don't acknowledge the Geneva Convention. If you don't know what that is, there's an agreed upon humanitarian, humanitarian conduct during conflict even in the midst of wars that decide the futures of nations and empires, <clears throat> we have agreed upon a manner of conduct as appropriate. Modern day terrorists don't recognize that. They have a different moral code. Women and children are not off limits. They're used as weapons. They're used as shields. It's a part of the conflict. You may look at that and say, well, it's not fair. It, I, I agree but it's a change in strategy and tactic, and we're naive if we don't acknowledge it. Well, there's a spiritual struggle taking place in the earth, and it's between good and evil. And it aligns itself more in description with what we see in the nature of modern-day terrorists than it does a conflict where the principles participate in the Geneva Convention. It's evil. By definition, it's a conflict between good and evil. And in the church, we have been very vulnerable because we've heard the phrase that we should love everybody, that God is love. And it's true that God is love. And we have assignments to love our enemies. But it doesn't say that we always have to be kind. Jesus wasn't always kind. Jesus said some rather harsh things. God certainly throughout Scripture is not always kind. He's a God of judgment just as certainly as he's a God of love. And the church is going to have to mature a bit. We're going to have to grow up. We've had so much, so much affluence, so much security. Our threats were distant that we've been able to have a, a rather theoretical faith. But the world has changed. Many components have spoken into that, but the reality is we are in a new world. And the church is going to have to grow with that. It's a rather awkward truth. And when I say awkward, not that it is any less significant or less important. It's just one we would rather not hear. You ever gone to the doctor and gotten an awkward truth? You know, you, you, you're too heavy. No, I'm too short. <laughs> I, I've never won that argument, but it makes perfect sense to me. At 6'5", I would be healthy. 
awkward truth. Awkward truth is truth a lot of times you want to avoid, you don't want to think about. You'd rather not dwell on it. You'd just rather move on. Can't we think about something happier? That's a little awkward. But the reality is awkward truth, typically the best way through it is to embrace it as soon as possible. To meet it head on, to embrace it fully and completely and totally. And I would submit that's true with this particular discussion. Awareness is a key. Maybe you prefer vigilance, but being aware matters. In John chapter 10 and verse 10, Jesus is speaking and he said, the thief, Satan, he comes only to steal, to kill and destroy. But I'm come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Now, Jesus defined the broad parameters of our lives. We're caught between this conflict between the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of darkness. There's not a third option. There's not a third rail. And Satan and his entire host, his entire kingdom, have one ultimate objective, your destruction. If they can't totally destruct, destroy your life, they'll do their best to disrupt it to steal from you what God intended you to have. They'll try to discourage you, diminish you, limit your effectiveness, hinder you, hamper you, torment you. It's a kingdom of torment and diminishment and destruction. And when you entertain ungodliness or immorality or wickedness or darkness, you invite that into your life. Just as certainly as when you invite the Spirit of God into your life and you choose Jesus as Lord, that you choose deliverance and restoration and forgiveness and wholeness. Jesus said it. This isn't some abstract notion of a preacher. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that you can have life and have it to the full. The fullest possible life for a human being is yielded to the Lordship of Jesus of Nazareth. He won't diminish you. He won't take something from you. He won't limit you. In fact, he'll take the limits off of your life. So as Christ followers, then we are engaged in a conflict. You don't have to choose it. Simply by your participation in the kingdom of God, you have an enemy who has targeted you. So I don't like that. I'd rather not think about it. I know it's awkward. But ignoring it won't change that reality. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 21, it says, don't be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good. Multiple assignments in that short little sentence. Don't be overcome by evil. Don't allow evil to overcome you. Recognize it for what it is. Don't yield to it. Don't accommodate it. Don't give it greater authority. But then we're given another assignment. We have to overcome evil. That's not a passive response. That's not just withdrawing. That's not just isolation. We've been given an an assertive role to overcome evil. It seems to me that the 21st century church and much of the 20th century church chose a different path. We chose to overlook evil. We just accommodated. No, I didn't notice. Didn't pay much attention. Wasn't affecting me directly, so I just didn't look. But that's not the assignment. I believe we'll be held accountable if we spend our lives overlooking evil. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil, not with anger, not with hate, not with violence, not with politics. Overcome evil with good. I'll give you one more verse that's right into this discussion. Revelation 21, that's very near the end of the book. It's the identification of who the victors are, who is triumphant at the end of the entire story, who is going to receive the blessing and the benefit of participating in the kingdom of God. It's Revelation 21, 7. He who overcomes will inherit all of this, and I'll be his God, and he'll be my son. He who overcomes. We've rewritten that. He who's born again. He who's saved. He who gets baptized. I believe in all of those things. I believe in conversion. I'm very much an advocate for baptism. They're biblically directed. But we're not done there. That's just your entry into the journey. The objective of being born again, the the objective of salvation, the objective of the, the obedience in baptism is to add momentum so that you will have the tools you need to lead the life of an overcomer. Not just in overcoming the challenges that present to you. Every life has challenges to overcome. Every one of us, disappointments, hardships, things that we didn't intend to be a part of our journey that encroach upon our lives. Those things we all have to deal with 
The kingdom assignment is standing together shoulder to shoulder as the body of Christ to see evil overcome. We don't yield to it. We don't accommodate it. We intend to see it diminished. I intend to see Jesus welcomed into our public schools, into our college campuses. I look forward to having multiple choices in public elections between godly individuals. Why would we yield? God is capable of doing that. We've embraced immorality, ungodliness, and wickedness for too long. The Bible is so clear. God has made abundant provision. We don't have to lead lives of fear. I'm telling you, fear stalks the streets of our nation today. We're afraid to say what we think. We're afraid for our own physical health. We're afraid for our children. We're afraid for our resources. Fear is walking our streets. Church, we have an answer. Listen to what the scripture says. Psalm 98, verse 1, sing to the Lord a new song. Now, you don't need to sing a new song if your old song is perfect. We need some new songs. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made his salvation known and revealed his righteousness to the nations. I intend to be a part of a generation that sees the righteousness of our Lord declared to the nations. It would be a good thing. It would be a good thing. It would be a good thing. We've apologized for it for too long. Well, we don't want to be appropriate another's culture. If the culture is destructive and diminishing and facilitates evil in the lives of people, there is a better solution. All worldviews aren't the same. All belief systems don't have the same outcomes. There aren't many approaches to God. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. If the church doesn't believe that, who will? God will work salvation. Again, not angry, not critical. Isaiah 42, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. Righteousness is a big old word. In the biblical sense, it's the ability to stand in the presence of God without fear, without guilt, and without shame. Now, we're all broken folk. Nobody here wants the darkest chapters of your life on the big screens at church. In fact, if we had spiritual detectors at the door like they have metal detectors at the airport, that when you walk through that little rascal, it would flash on the screen the dark parts of your heart. Building be empty today. Because pastor would be outside. <laughs> but righteousness comes to us as a gift through faith in Jesus Christ. And then there's a power that takes up resident within us, the Spirit of God, to help us begin to learn. And we have to learn to do this. We have to choose to do this to lead righteous lives. You can't accept the gift of righteousness and then give yourself to unrighteousness and think that you will receive the benefits. We receive the gift of righteousness so that we might have the help, the power, the authority of the Spirit of God, that we can begin to learn to lead righteous lives. But you have to care about it. It has to matter to you. God won't do it to you. God won't make you stop sinning. We could all testify to that. But he gives us the power to overcome it. So he said, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness. I will take hold of your hand. I'll keep you and will make you to be a covenant for the people and a light for the nations. I like the image of that, a small child taking a parent's hand in a frightening situation. You don't typically have to look for them, they'll find your hand. And it, the size difference is always, it makes an impact upon me. As if my size is a protection. If they really understood the threat, they'd know my hand doesn't make any difference at all. But God said, he'll take us by the hand. Do we have the humility to say, God, I need your help. We need your help. For all of our experience and all of the, what all we represent, and it's amazing, the gifts God gives us and the, the things he entrusts us to, but he's not like us. 
He spoke the world into existence. He understands the nature of the conflict. I don't believe God is trivial with his resources or he uses them unnecessarily. And if he has made hundreds of millions of angels available to us, it's because we need the assistance. Perhaps we could have the humility to say, God, I need your help. I want to take your hand. I love the image. He'll take me by the hand. I come to the end of myself and my wisdom and my planning on a daily basis. I say, Lord, I need your help. I need your help. There are things arrayed around me and standing in opposition to me that are more powerful than I'm capable of overcoming. God, help me. And day after day after day, I watch him make a way. Now, that's not always what I want. I want him just to totally annihilate anything that would impede, resist. And God said, no, let me help you through today. Okay. There's a battle raging in our earth. Have you noticed? You know, we, we still have enough affluence and enough means of distraction that you can shop your way into oblivion or engage in your hobby and try to look away or Find the next goal on your life plan and ignore it. But there's a battle raging in the earth. There are many examples of it in our nation. We, we can't, we have lost sight of some very fundamental things, even how to define what marriage is. We can't reach agreement on that, folks. That's a battle. We provide unfettered access to abortion and use federal monies to provide it for other nations in the world. We have violence in our cities. And for the most part, we just look away and go, I'm glad it's not my city. It is our city. It's our nation. Basic civil rights have been set aside. Oh, they offer us reasons and excuses. But once set aside, they're much easily, much more easily set aside again. Our borders we've decided not to enforce. I mean, there are multiple. We could, we could spend much time talking about the challenges in our nation. And most of them are just as real and rampant within the church as they are without. This is not a self-righteous, finger-wagging lecture. In the world, there are challenges. You know, Mexico, Central America are in disarray. And we see the evidence of that at our borders. Tremendous compassion for those nations, but they're unstable. Mexico's violent. Africa, we have friends in multiple African nations. And we talked about South Africa recently, the violence there, the unrest there, the, the fear. Europe, Western Europe is an empty shell. Well, they still look pretty good. They have some beautiful historic buildings, but the reality is Western Europe has little strength and an almost completely decayed moral foundation. They no longer have the foundation from which to project strength. They've lost their moral compass. The Middle East, we don't have to talk a great deal about that. Israel. Hamas and Hezbollah raining rockets on them anytime the world looks away. Iran busily constructing the, the resources they need to build nuclear weapons. And the world, it's just an awkward truth. We just prefer not to think about it. They've told us what they'll do. They've said it repeatedly, plainly, boldly in the press without hesitation. They'll destroy the nation of Israel and the United States. Perhaps nuclear weapons wouldn't be a good idea. Well, that's a little unkind to say that. Afghanistan today, we withdrew our military and left American citizens there. It's unthinkable. It's just unthinkable. We don't do that. We have to pray. This is not a political problem. It's not about a political party or about an individual cabinet. Folks, it takes the entire bureaucracy to make something that awful happen. Entrenched, lifelong government servants signing off on that. Please don't imagine this is about a politician. Washington is nothing more than a mirror in which we see our own hearts. There's a conflict in the earth today, a battle raging. It's not a new struggle. This is not the first time. We're not the first generation. Are we approaching the end of the age? I think there's a very real argument for that, but not because of just the struggle we see in the world. There have been generations where tremendous Awful, destructive forces have been unleashed on humanity. It's just our selfishness that when that bumps into us, we say, oh, it has to be the end of the world. And then we craft a theology that says, well, I'm not going to have to deal with the end of the world, so I don't have to pay any attention. Let's go back to the party. What a destructive notion. 
When we see darkness increasing, we have to understand we have an assignment to be light. This is not a new thing in Acts chapter 4. Very near the beginning of the church initiative. Jesus went back to heaven in Acts 1. Acts chapter 2 is the day of Pentecost when the church goes public. In Acts chapter 4, it says the priest and the captains of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They were disturbed, angry, because they were talking about Jesus being raised from the dead, declaring him to be the Son of God. The opposition hasn't changed much in 2,000 years. That story's resisted right now, all over our nation. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. They put him in jail overnight because they were talking about Jesus. But many who heard the message believed and the number of men grew to about 5,000. You willing to spend the night in jail so the gospel can proliferate? Are you willing for me to? Oh. <laughs> Different question, sorry. We've gotten a little soft. We think suffering is parking two rows further away from the building than we wanted to. Sitting, not sitting in the sanctuary where we wanted to be. Not having the people participating in worship that we wanted to hear. Acts chapter 14, a little further in story, says they preached the good news in that city and they won a large number of disciples. We'd like to see that happen. Large numbers of new disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, and Antioch, strengthening the disciples and encouraging them to remain true to the faith. This was their message. It's in quotes. We must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. We got to go through many hardships. Well, Pastor Audrey, it's, it's, it's a little awkward. Can't we talk about something else? Why do we go through hardships? Because life is hard? No, because there's a conflict in the earth. There are spiritual forces influencing your life today, some for you, some opposing you. We're going to talk about that battleground and how they intersect with your life in, in a little bit more detail. But let's go to Acts chapter 19. Paul is in the city of Ephesus. And he's having some success with his gospel message. It says he entered the synagogue in Acts 19, verse 8, and spoke boldly there for three months. He argued persuasively about the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom message. It's not a church message. Some of them became obstinate, and they refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. Please note the choices. They refused belief. I'm not going to believe that. You see, when you choose against God, what you do, whether you've done it on purpose or not, if you've aligned yourself with the kingdom of darkness. Unbelief's not a casual thing. The Bible calls it a heart of unbelief wicked. You see, when you believe God, when you believe his word, when you're faithful to God and faithful to his word, you bring alignment with his kingdom. When you refuse to believe, you're reading your Bible. So, you know, I just don't know if I believe that. You're, you're standing in a very dangerous place of aligning yourself with those forces in opposition to God. So they're in Ephesus. Many people are believing, but some refuse to believe. And typically, then they become opponents because they've given themselves over to a spirit that opposes that message. They begin to publicly malign the way. So Paul left them. He took disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and the Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. An entire region of that, the world has heard the gospel. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Are you up for that category? Not just miracles. Extraordinary miracles. <laughs> That's another day. Even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Could you receive that way? Are you willing to receive that way? I want somebody to pray for me. Well, I, I prayed over this cloth. Lay it on yourself. And, oh, wait a minute. I mean, I know what's in the Bible, but it's not what I want. I understand that. But I think a part of what God is awakening us to is not just to get what we want in the way we want it, but how to cooperate with him. Seems to me we've had an 18 month seminar and what you want doesn't get to go to the head of the line. And in the midst of not getting all of our wants, are we willing to follow the Lord in some new ways? 
Are we willing to open our heart and our mind? Are we willing to interact? Are we willing to serve? Are we willing to change our routine? Are we just going to close our fist and stomp our feet and say, I I want what I want? Well, some Jews went around driving out evil spirits. And they tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And they would say, in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. And they turned the page. (laughs) And seven sons of a Jewish high priest. There's a a Jewish priest that has seven sons. And they were watching this. And they're engaging in this. And one day, the evil spirit answered them. Jesus, I know. And I know about Paul. But who are you? It's not apparent in English, but in Greek... There's two different words there. When it says, Jesus, I know, there's one Greek word used, and it says, and I know about Paul, there's another word used. Jesus, I understand. Paul, I know about him. But I don't know you. The man who had the evil spirit jumped on them, overpowered them all. Seven brothers against one stranger. That's a humiliating outcome, but it gets worse. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and the Greeks living in the city, they were seized with fear. And the name of the Lord was held in high honor. God took something that was a disastrous failure and used it for his purposes. Many of those who believed... Hope you'll circle that word, those who believed, because the rest of what we're about to read is something that took place in the community of believers, not amongst the pagans, amongst those who believed. Because Paul's been preaching for three months, there's quite the community of believers. A number of those, the, the many of those who believed came and openly confessed their evil deeds. Do we have the imagination that in the midst of those who believe, there is still the intentional cultivation of evil deeds? Yes is the answer. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. It's a remarkable little story. It's helpful for our circumstance right now. It says the fear of the Lord grew in the city in verse 17. That would be a primary objective. We want the respect, the reverence, the awe of God to increase all over our communities. Coast to coast and border to border, congregation to congregation, school to school, university campus to university campus. Let the fear of the Lord come. Let a reverence for God, a respect for God, a sense of awe for God would be a good thing. It says in verse 18 that the believers repented. Folks, that's where change will begin, in the hearts of God's people, not with the people you disagree with. Stop defending our positions and begin to say to the Lord, if there's any place in my heart, in my life, in my practice that limits what you could do or would do, help me to see it. I want to change. We need desperately some change. And it has to begin within us. The believers repented. that They made a tremendous financial sacrifice to separate themselves from sin. It's a little lost because of the, the measures that are used. It says that they came with... 50,000 drachmas. A drachma was a coin that was worth about a day's wage. So the number's a little fluid, but if we, let's, let's say the, the value was $100. 50,000 drachmas is $5 million. They came, they didn't sell it on eBay. They didn't post it in some online marketplace. They destroyed $5 million worth of goods in order to distance themselves from sin. It's an important lesson. And then the outcome in verse 20, it says, in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. In what way? By confronting demonic strongholds through repentance and separation from the occult. That is the way for the word of God to spread widely. We see the need for the word of God to spread. Are we willing to submit ourselves 
to the leading of the Holy Spirit? Are we willing to engage in the conflict? Are we willing to yield our lives to overcome evil so that the word of God can spread widely? Rather than hold the attitude that it would get better if the wicked people would just change. That's a popular message. That will work on every side of the aisle, amongst every group. All you have to do is identify the wicked people as those not in front of you. (laughs) Oh, you know it's true. You watch it because somebody takes the clips and shows you people speaking to various audiences, saying polar opposite things, trying to win influence and curry favor. But with the people of God, that's not a good idea. If we'll begin to humble ourselves and say to the Lord, Lord, I'm willing to be different. God will move. He'll bring salvation with his arm. He'll take things that seem to be humiliating and destructive and cause them to become powerful tools in his purposes. He'll take the most broken places in our lives, the places where our weakness can't be hidden, and he'll cause his strength to be made evident and give hope to other people with those same places of brokenness and weakness. We don't have to hide our failures. God's restoring them. Now, I want to wrap this up with a, some, some quick observations regarding this, this kingdom of Satan. Again, it's inconvenient. We'd rather not think about it. It's not particularly popular. But the beginning point, it seems so fundamental, but there is a devil. The embodiment of evil, an orchestrator of evil in the world. Jesus believed in him. Luke 10, verse 18, Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, I've studied in some some academic settings, you know, where they said that, well, the first century people believed in demons and angels and spirits. So some of that's reflected in the New Testament. But we're far more enlightened than that now. That fills many of our theological schools and informs many of our pulpits. And many of us are reluctant to acknowledge the devil because we think we're diminishing our intellect or in some way stepping away from the the, the educations that we sacrificed and we worked to establish. But if Jesus came as a revelation of the Father, if he came to give to us an insight into our world and how to be a participant in the kingdom of God beyond anything we had had up to that point, You diminish Jesus. You make a mockery of his story to accept a premise like that. Jesus believed in the devil. So I will too. We've behaved a bit as if we were just too educated, too sophisticated to be influenced by the devil. We try to believe, if that doesn't work, we'll try to believe that maybe our denomination or the congregation where we worship is too sophisticated or too enlightened to be caught up in a discussion about evil. It's just unseemly. After all, today we have psychology. I'm not opposed to psychology. But to imagine that the study of psychology removes the arena of evil spirits would be like saying studying biology removes a virus. Or maybe we just prefer to say, you know, those things just really don't bother us in our country. We believe those kind of spiritual forces might exist, but they're a part of nations someplace else. Maybe less developed nations, nations with perhaps a little less sophistication. They believe in voodoo or other strange things, but they don't bother us here. What arrogance. Just suppose I put you in charge of evil. You had the assignment to distribute the the, the forces of evil in the world. Would you focus them on the remotest places on the planet, the places that had few, if any, means of communication or influence? Or would you focus them on the the centers of wealth and power? Because if you could change thoughts in those places, you could influence the entire planet. I think you know where you would focus them. Then I meet those people who go, you know, I just don't believe there's a devil. Well, bless your heart. I would join you if disbelief would change the reality. So you can say, I don't believe in gravity. But if you step off the edge of the roof of your house, you're still going to fall at 9.8 meters per second squared. All the way to splat. I don't believe in gravity. I don't believe in... There is a devil. He rules the kingdom. 
He rules a kingdom just as certainly as God reigns over a kingdom. They're not equal in power. They're not equal in magnitude. I'm not suggesting it's a close. But he rules a kingdom because he began his journey in the kingdom of God. He rebelled against God. He led a rebellion and a third of the angels joined him. It's a significant number. Think of what you know about angels. There's more than 70,000 as a part of Jesus' personal escort. In one snapshot in the book of Revelation, there's a hundred million angels. The children all have an angel that have the Father's attention. There's a significant number of angels. A third of them rebelled and went with Satan. A lot of angels on the dark side. He rules the kingdom. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin. When you choose to practice sin, not to be tempted by it, the practice of sin is different than the temptation of sin. Practicing sin is giving yourself to sin, yielding to it, making it a part of your routine, your habit. There are many people who imagine themselves to be Christ followers who practice sin. It's a very, very dangerous place to stand. We all understand the temptations. We all face them. It's ludicrous to sit in church and act like we don't. It's not easier for somebody else. You wrestle with sin. I wrestle with sin. Nobody's excluded from that arena. The good news is we're not all tempted on all points, but we all have points where we're vulnerable. Know this, that when you choose to practice sin, it leads to death. That's why God hates it. Because he loves human beings. And he hates sin because it destroys us. He's not trying to limit your pleasure. We were dead in our transgressions and sins in which we used to live when we followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in the disobedient. Satan is described as the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The Bible talks about heaven in plural. Starts in Genesis 1, but it carries right into the New Testament. We'll look at that in some more detail. But Satan's kingdom is centered in one of those places we describe as the heavens. He's the ruler of the kingdom of the air. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who's qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. He's rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And he brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. If we had the ability this morning to charter planes and the freedom to land them in that airport in Kabul in Afghanistan this morning, and the ability to deliver the Americans that are in that nation from wherever they are into that airport and load them on those planes, what do you think their attitude would be when you walked down the aisle and said, would you like a Coke or a Diet Coke? Think they'd be thankful or indifferent? Think they'd be mad because you had peanuts and not pretzels? No, I don't think so. I think they'd understand they'd been delivered from almost certain death. And I think they would get on that plane with a sense of gratitude and appreciation. Does that seem right to you? Well, it would help us in our imagination. It would help us through this awkward truth that we would prefer to look away from if we would meditate a little bit on the fact that he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. He rescued us. We didn't rescue ourselves. I didn't seek the Lord and find God. God called me when I was a rebellious, stubborn, ornery, wicked hillbilly. And he brought me into the kingdom of his son. And he's, I've been a project ever since. He's still working on me. And I hope he's working on you. And I hope you're cooperating. Because there's a kingdom arrayed against you that intends to destroy you, to keep you from the kingdom of God. Far more dangerous than the Taliban. Far greater threat than a flash flood. Because it can do more than destroy your physical body. It can cause your, your soul to be cast into the hell. That's Jesus' warning, not mine. We've been rescued from the kingdom of darkness. And brought into the kingdom of the son he loves. In whom we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. Every day of our lives there should be a moment when we say, God... Thank you. You delivered me from darkness. You have forgiven me. You're not ashamed to call me your child in all of my brokenness. Thank you, God, for what you've done. 
And I'll stand up for you wherever you send me, wherever I work, wherever I live, wherever my children go. Don't anybody ask me the absurd question to come and not talk about my friend because he rescued me from darkness. And he'll do it for you. He'll change your life too. He'll bring meaning and deliver you from futility and the frustration of pursuing yourself because self is never satisfied. You'll always want more, more pleasure, more stuff, more opportunities. It'll never satisfy you. It's a lie and it'll lead you on a path until you've spent every day and your strength is gone and your years are past and everything you've chased will run through your fingers and you'll step into an de eternity of destruction. It's a lie. Amen. But God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness Amen. and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves. He's redeemed us and forgiven us our sins. It's a message for the world to hear. So if the daily Bible reading is like a burden and church is like, oh my God, does it come every two days? What is this? I don't get to sit where I want to sit. If you were coming out of Kabul today, I don't think you'd care what seat you got assigned. You put me in a pet carrier, just put me on that plane. We've had a bad attitude for so long. We have been overlookers, not overcomers. Yes. Come on. Yes. And the closer it is to us, the more we want to overlook it. Because it's really awkward if it's close to you. There is a devil, he rules the kingdom, and he can influence your life and mine. If you don't add this next piece, it's just theoretical. He can influence your life. His principal ways of influencing your life are in your mind, your thoughts, in your emotions. You, you, you need an awareness that there are evil spirits that can access your emotions. Not every emotion you have is godly. People say, you can't tell me how I feel. No, but I can tell you some feelings are ungodly. I'm not saying they're not your feelings, but I'm saying if you own that feeling, it's going to take you someplace destructive. We have such a culture of indulgence. We'll look at some of this in the scripture in the next few sessions. He can influence your mind, your emotions, and he can influence you physically. I'll give you a couple of examples. Luke chapter 13. Does anybody remember Luke's day job before he got into the, the, the writing business? He was a physician. He traveled with Paul. Lord knows Paul needed a traveling physician. Every place he went, he got the love of Jesus beat out of him. But he kept going. I'm not sure there's three of us that would have made the second trip with Paul. I mean, he did not. Yeah, anyway, Luke 13. Jesus, um, Luke is reporting Jesus in a synagogue on a Sabbath. A woman was there who had been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. It's an important sentence from the physician. There's a woman who is physically impaired because of the presence of an unclean spirit. Now, does it mean every physical impairment is caused by an unclean spirit? No. But it introduces the possibility that some are. Well, how would you know the difference? We'd have to know more about unclean spirits. Don't just be afraid. Ask the Spirit of God to begin to help us. That's the point of Scripture. She'd been crippled by a spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and couldn't straighten up at all. And Jesus acknowledges her, and it makes the, the, the audience in the synagogue angry because it wasn't in the order of service. That's not really the case. The, the real reason was they, they chose to categorize it as work, and you're not allowed to work on the Sabbath. And so Jesus had broken a Sabbath rule. Jesus is angry with them because they care more about their rules than they do about people. And his response is verse 16, should not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has kept bound for 18 long years, be set free on the Sabbath day from what bound her? Now Jesus' description of this woman is important for you and me. The covenant that's available to her is the covenant God made with Abraham. This woman isn't in a battle with an evil spirit because of her immorality. Jesus doesn't say that or her ungodliness. He simply says that a woman living in the full light of the covenant available to her is struggling 
with the intrusion of an unclean spirit. See, it's more popular in the contemporary church to say, well, unclean spirits, evil spirits, demonic spirits, they're all synonymous in the New Testament. Wouldn't bother a Christian. Well, if that's the case, why are we told to put on the armor of God? We create these little clever theological loopholes so we don't have to think about the awkward truths of Scripture. Luke chapter 9. It's a father and his son. The father's desperate. Jesus says to him, if you believe anything's possible. And the man says, I believe any father would that loved his son. But then his brain kicks in. He overrode his, his response was emotional. If, if believing is what my son needs, I'm a believer. But then his brain kicked in, and then and the father says, help my unbelief, because I don't know how to help him. And Jesus, listen to it. He said, this is the father's diagnosis. The spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams, and it throws him into convulsions so that he foams at the mouth. It scarcely ever leaves him, and it's destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Do you hear the desperation in the father? I've done everything I know to do. I brought my son to your disciples. I brought my son to strangers and admitted my son's problems. And I admitted the weaknesses in my family system and my powerlessness to help my son. That is not a comfortable place in a public setting. And then you hear the despair. After I did all that, your disciples couldn't help him. This man's beyond the end of his rope. Jesus said, oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? He's not mad at the man. He's looking at his disciples. Bring your son here. And even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him to the ground in a convulsion. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. He rebuked the spirit. The spirit had tormented that boy. It had physical implications. Does it mean every time... You have some physical response, there's a demon attached to it. No, it doesn't. But it does introduce the possibility. And if we're going to walk in the light of Scripture, we're going to have to begin to make room in our imagination that there are forces arrayed against us that are more powerful than a virus, that are more significant than a bacteria, because those things can only... They can only destroy our physical shell. That's what Jesus said. But he said there are forces arrayed against you that are far more powerful than those. And those are the ones you should really be concerned about. We spent a year and a half changing our life patterns and lifestyles and habits to help us stay healthier from a virus. And at the root of it, God is asking us to be aware of the real forces of evil arrayed against us. And our response is, well, that's just a little inconvenient. You believe in evil? You believe in terrorists? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And I hope you'll join me. It'll change the effectiveness of our faith. It'll change our generation. It'll change the lives and the futures of our children and our grandchildren. We'll stop delegating their futures to the politicians and we'll accept some responsibility for ourselves. I want to ask you to join me. We haven't talked about it in a bit, but I want to ask you to join me on Wednesday in a day of prayer and fasting for the families impacted by the floods and for those Americans that are still trapped in Afghanistan. I don't know how God will make a way in either circumstance, but we're going to ask him to make a way. I'm, I'm, that's up to the Lord how he chooses to do that. I'm not dictating that. But I think those are two places where there are clearly spiritual forces in play and the response of the church matters. If you've never fasted before, fasting is abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. It means you miss a meal and you take the time you would normally put around enjoying that meal or preparing it to pray. Open your Bible. Maybe you read your, your Bible reading. Maybe you have a prayer. If, if, you've got, if, you work, if you're doing it at work and there's another believer, maybe you recruit somebody and you take your break time and, and you have a little prayer around those topics. If you're doing it as a family, maybe you have a prayer before. We used to fast as a family until four in the afternoon. And then when we had the evening meal before we ate, we would pray about whatever it was we were fasting about. We learned that as little boys. Use wisdom around your health. If you have health concerns that make that unwise, you make a plan that considers your health. Don't be foolish and blame it on God. Foolish is not spiritual. Come on. It's true. 
But if you would, we have service Wednesday night. We'll have some prayer before we start that service or as a part of that service. But we need to see God's response. It's goofy to, talk, to have religious lectures and not do something with it. So I won't ask for a show of hands, but, if, but if, don't just you recruit somebody. We need far more than are gathered on our campus this weekend to fast and pray. There's a battle tearing at the fabric of our nation, our world, and the church has a role to play. How exciting is that? God called us to this season. Just stand with me. I want to pray with you. I want to pray, and if you're open, this would be my prayer for myself and for you. That the Spirit of God would give us the ability to believe in Him more fully than we have believed previously. You grow in belief like you grow in physical strength. You grow in belief like you learn English. It's a progressive thing. It's not static. The way you knew God 10 years ago is not adequate for the challenges we face today. We need to know Him in a new way. Does that feel right to you? So if you're willing for the Lord to do that, I'm going to ask the Spirit of God to begin to invite us towards belief in some new ways. Hallelujah. Lord, thank you for your word, for its truth and its power. I thank you that you love us, that you have delivered us from the dominion of darkness and you brought us into the kingdom of the Son you love, that you have redeemed us and forgiven us that you've justified us, that you've sanctified us. Father, things we could have never earned or deserved or paid for or qualified for, by your sovereign choice, you have selected us and we thank you for it today. Forgive us for our indifference. Forgive us when we have walked in just complete ambivalence to you with our own desires. Lord, we come today and we ask you to begin to lead us on a new path. Help us to learn to believe in new ways, to trust you more fully, to follow with greater obedience, to be joyful and enthusiastic about the privilege of being your children. We thank you for it. Lord, give us discernment, wisdom, insight and understanding, a new boldness from you. Thank you for what you'll do. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Hey, this is Pastor Allen. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, like it, and most importantly, share it with your friends. If you want to be notified when there's new content and we post new material, if you'll just subscribe to my channel and hit the bell, you'll get the notification. Most of all, I pray God blesses you as you continue on your spiritual journey and open your heart to the Lord. God bless.